All right. Welcome. This is the Anyone Can Farm live chat on the Anyone Can Farm Experience channel. I'm Mark, your host, coming to you from Baker's Green Acres in Marion, Michigan. And tonight, uh, our show is going to be sponsored by... Um, us we're the sponsors <laughs> no i don't have any sponsors right now i was gonna say the uh uh orphans of the american dream film company they were going to be our sponsors tonight i was just going to fill them in there that's joe's company name joe's doing joe's my second oldest son and he's doing our our audio visual now and doing a darn good Good job. You put a video up. today. It's on the Anyone Can Farm Experience uh, YouTube, and it was about the charcuterie class that we just had here a couple weekends ago. And I thought it was really good. It's worth watching, so you should get over there and see that. All right, Keith is with us. Great. All right, tonight, uh, as promised, we're going to talk about biochar again, but I have my apparatus here where I can draw on so I can show you <clears throat> a little bit of the inner workings of a uh, retort or a biochar retort. It is a gasifier, but it's not the type of gasifier that we're uh, removing the gas. Uh, we are turning that gas back under to aid in the pyrolysis action all right so i'm going to go into that i'm going to get to doing a little drawing on here so i can show you what those things are going to look like um, but before we start that i'd like to talk a little bit about bio biochar production on the homestead you know a lot of uh, what we talk about on the homestead are streams of income basically and I've heard people say that you should have probably 10 streams of income, which that makes a little bit of sense to me. Uh, I have several streams of income. Let's see, I have the chicken butchering business that we run in the summertime. We're usually doing that one or two days a week. Uh, we have our chicken production uh, facet where we produce our own pastured poultries and we sell pastured poultries. Uh, we have our hog production. Uh, in that hog production, we, we do butchering. So we're making products for the freezer that are sold. Um, we are making charcuterie products that are sold. We are selling live animals to people, uh, big ones and small ones. I saw, I sold four of them today <coughs> to a lady from the UP came all the way down here to get pigs. Amazing. Um, we sell breeding stock to people. Uh, we sell full-size animals. They want to come here and actually process them themselves on our property. We do that. Uh, let's see. What else do we do? We do uh, consulting. That's a source of source of income or a stream of income. I do on on phone. I do in person consulting. Uh, we do classes on our farm, and we do classes on other people's farms. That's a nice source of income. Uh, we do milk. Milk four cows right now. Um, let's see. That's it. And we butcher cattle. So we're, we're selling Hamburg, and mostly Hamburg, most of the... The uh, other cuts uh, stay right here and get you, our staff. Uh, so right there, we've got I, those. That's at least 10 streams of income, I think. And <clears throat> there are other things. Oh, puppies. Yeah, we have uh, Great Pyrenees dogs, and we uh, breed them, and we sell the puppies. Uh, Great Pyrenees dog will breed twice a year. 
if you let them. And you can get, oh, eight puppies is probably pretty standard. Uh, a puppy is worth $500. So let's see, let's say you had two eights. So you'd have 16 puppies times $500. I should know that. Pretty bad, huh? Somebody's going to chime in here. Oh, Jack's with us. Where you been, bro? So 500 times 16. Eight G's on puppies. And it's crazy. People will shell out a $500 bill for a puppy quick. But... Um, other stuff that seems to be more important, they, they won't. Uh, a lot of people don't want to be in the, the dog breeding business. But, you know, it's something that we've done because we always want to make sure we have enough dogs for us. Right now we have, let's see, one, two, three Great Pyrenees dogs, two females and a male. The, fe the newest female is very young. She's... Uh, probably 14 weeks old, something like that. She's pretty young. We just got her. Chloe is her name. If she was around here, I'd show her to you. <clears throat> and another one is coming in about two weeks, a male. And the, the new male that's coming, he's just a, a little shaver, but he'll eventually be replacing Obi. Obi's more interested on what's in what's on TV these days. <laughs> Okay, Jack, been busy reevaluating re your life and situation. That's, I understand that. I go through that a lot. If I can be of any service to you, please let me know. And I mean that. I can talk with you on the phone or other, you know, but I'd be glad to do that. All right, great. Inga, Keith. All right, so... Uh, Oh, and biochar. Biochar is a stream of income here, too. It is. Uh, at one time, I had a service. Well, my, my Ford pickup, I had it set up like a service truck. had my welding machine on, and I had a couple of toolboxes. And I used to go around and do stuff for people. I'd fix stuff, do welded repairs. And uh, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I liked that. Had fun doing that. Um, I wasn't real smart in those days about being ripped off. You know, when someone said, oh, I don't have a checkbook on me. Uh, I'll have to catch up with you when I can. Some of those guys, I still see them and they owe me money. Right. And uh, what you have to do when, let's say you make a welded repair on somebody's equipment and they say, oh, I don't have... I, I don't have my checkbook on me. I'll have to catch up with you. Say, hand me that cutting torch. And then you light that baby off and say, I'm going to give you 15 minutes to get back here with a check or I'm cutting this thing off. I'm going to, I'm going to reverse my repair. That's what you have to do. Like I've got people that don't still owe me money for stuff. So I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing back then. Um, and I used to uh, I used to cut hay for people too, and I got ripped off on that a couple times. This is a guy that still owes me, you know. I cut and bailed his hay, left an invoice. He just never paid. Like like I never, like I never did it. But he sure did feed the hay, and I should have gone and taken the hay. Should have just gone right in his barn and taken it. But anyway, that's the way that is. What I'm doing now is a lot better. I like it a whole lot better. I really like what I'm doing. So. So today, uh, Joe was here and we did filming and the filming is for a documentary that Joe is putting together and it's like a video series uh, of home butchery, right? It's the Homestead Hog Harvest, but in video form. So it's going to be placed on our our website and if a person wants to download it they 
can pay for it. It's pretty nominal. Uh, but then they can get it downloaded and you can watch it and stop and watch it and stop. And I think it'll be pretty good. Joe felt as though he did a pretty good job today of, of capturing it. And then he did some of Jill's handiwork, you know, because part of the Homestead hog harvest is grinding and uh, putting stuff in, in um, tubes, you know, sausage tubes and all that stuff. So we were busy here all day. Uh, I am working with my son, Jim, pretty uh, steadily on the biochar project. Uh, our chicks were supposed to be here Tuesday. And we called today and said, hey, uh, did you guys ship them? And they said, oh, they're going to be shipping tomorrow or the next day. And then today's the next day, I guess. Yeah. And I called them and said, oh, I see what went wrong. They'll be going out Monday. And it was just something in the lady's voice that made me feel like, I wonder if we're going to get chickens this year. Because somebody, Hildy, I think, sent me a, a, a story, and I haven't listened to it yet, <clears throat> about all over the countryside, chickens are dying. Let's see. I'll, I'll read you this. I am going to listen to it. Yeah, bird flu in America. Millions of sick chickens and turkeys prepare now with food. I'm hearing a lot of that lately. I'm, I just am. I guess we always have, though, haven't we? It's always one thing or another. <clears throat> I, I read a story about uh, the Department of Agriculture had put out in Georgia that they were banning backyard flocks. So I think that's pretty interesting. Let's say you've got a bunch of laying chickens and they're saying they're banning it. Oof, more of the same. Uh, so we'll see what happens. I hope our chickens show up on Monday. But if they don't, I guess I'll just be eating beef, which is fine with me. I do like chicken, but I sure like beef. Sure like beef. Okay, so let's talk about making biochar yourself on your homestead and creating a stream of income with it. So uh, for the effort that we put into it here, uh, we sell it by the pound and it depends who's, who's making it and under what name, but uh, I don't think that it needs to be sold for less than $5 a pound. A lot of work goes into it. And uh, about $5 is about what you can expect to pay. I do see it much cheaper, but when I look into it, it is not the retort method of making. It's basically, they have a conveyor, the chips are going over it, and they're just hitting them with flame and turning them black. And I just don't, It's I don't think it's the same product. I just don't. If you want to get it and use it, go ahead. But the amount of effort that we put into making this, uh, we sell it for $5 a pound. And it seems seems about fair to me, I mean, for the work that we put into it. So some of the things that you're going to need, uh, you're going to need a retort. So we're going to go over that in a minute, what that retort looks like on the inside. Hello, Nancy. And what it's made out of, what we've made ours out of. I'm on the Generation 5 retort right now. And Joe and I were talking today about maybe Generation 6. Uh, if, if what could happen does happen with biochar, uh, there could be a, a, a tremendous uh, call for it. And if there was, and you could get that $5 a pound for it, you could have a nice stream of income. Uh, if you're in the, if you've got the right circumstances going on. Okay. So where I am, uh, less than four miles up the road, there is a mill that makes 
kits for pallets, all right? So they saw out everything that a person would need to put a pallet together on the floor, you know, and nail it all together. And then there's another shop that's uh, about two miles away where they make pallets. It's a pallet shop. Both of them are Amish, right? Uh, I've known the guys that run these places uh, for like 15, 15 years. So uh, when I go in there, if I need help with something, they're pretty good about giving me help. You know, uh, I get along pretty good with the Amish because we're, we're a little bit, we're more on the same page than the, the big farmers around here, the big farmers around here, none of them talk to me. I, well, they know me, but I don't, they, none of them ever talk to me or drink that. So, so I, I get along pretty good with the Amish. I like them for the most part. Some of them can be pretty shrewd business people. So you got to be careful with that. But <clears throat> anyway, we can all be like that, I guess. You have to make a special request to not get your baby chick vaccinated before they get shipped. Vaccinated for what? I didn't know that. Is this with Townline? You sound like you know what you're talking about there, Inga. Fill us in, please. But to, to run a biochar operation, whether it's going to be one that you are doing for an income stream or just for your own personal use, you're going to need a couple things. They all get a shot. Ooh. For what? Don't tell me COVID-19. Don't tell me that. I don't want That's gone, right? Isn't that over? That's over because now it's Russia again. Are we back on Russia? I, just for fun today on my feed, I put up a little uh, thing and I said, apparently I'm hearing that there's a new variant called the Russian disease that is spread via Chinese cookies. And there's two, re two restaurants in Ukraine that have it. I don't know if anybody said anything back, but I was just trying to be funny. Uh, okay, but if you're going to run a biochar operation, you're going to need a source of wood, and it needs to be dry, right? So this this uh, mill that I deal with, they get a lot of blocks, you know, cut off ends and stuff, and uh, a lot of them are, you know, maybe four by four pieces, and I get it by the truckload. Uh, my 10 yard dump full is about a hundred and this year it's, it's more, it's $125, right? 125. It used to be that they would put dumpsters, they fill dumpsters and they would drop five of them in my truck and they were $20 a piece <clears throat> and now they're $25 a piece. So, uh, everything's going up, right? But a truckload of those blocks, I can heat my house with about two of those truckloads for the entire winter. I haven't been doing it lately because we've just been buying log length and sawing it up and you get a better quality wood when you do that than the blocks. The blocks seem to absorb a lot of moisture and stuff. But I, I did blocks for like 10 years or, or longer, probably 15 years. It's just the last couple of years I haven't been doing it. Like when I went up there the other day, the guy says, hey, man, where you been? I haven't seen you in a while. I said, yeah, I'm letting the other people have the blocks. There's like quite a bit of competition for them now. When I first started doing business with this mill, it was owned by a different group of Amish. But I kept driving by and it had a pile of these blocks and it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger until that pile was about half the size of my house. It was huge. And I stopped in and I wasn't used to Amish people then. I was new. They were new too. And I said, what, what's going to happen with that pile of blocks? Are you going to? And the guy's like, I don't know. Uh, I put a bunch of them out over there and I burned them. And those people over there uh, complained. 
and the fire department came and said, I shouldn't do that anymore. And I said, well, uh, I got a big truck. I could haul some of them off. How much do you want for them? And he says, well, uh, just for my diesel, uh, let's say $4 a load. So a 10 yard dump and I was getting for $4 a load. Unbelievable. So they just wanted to get rid of them and they were good hardwood blocks. And I, I had no place to keep them. So I brought them home and I dumped them and I dumped them and I dumped them. And I was just dumping them in the field. I had a spot. It's, it's where the calf pen is now. And, uh, you know, they're sitting on the ground, so they absorbed a lot of water coming up, and a lot of them turned rotten, and, but I, I heated the house for years off that pile and gave a bunch away and sold a bunch. So, but now it's $125 a truckload. But so I've weighed it before, and I think it was 6,500 pounds of wood. That's a lot of wood for 125 bucks. It really is. So... You have to have a supply of wood and it needs to be dry. Uh, the size on the wood should be no bigger than say four by four by four. I mean, that's about all that your retort is going to be able to gasify. Um, so uh, what we do sometimes when we're going hot and heavy making biochar is to get the wood dry We'll set it up on pallets and cover it with black plastic and the sun will bake out a lot of the heat uh, or a lot of the moisture out of it and you get a more efficient burn quicker. Uh, we did a burn yesterday and I went up to the mill and uh, I said, I need some dry wood. Have you got any dry wood? And the guy's like, well, the only thing that's even close to dry is this stuff over here and they had built a pallet of you know the staves on a pallet you know the skinny pieces that they nail to the top they nail to the runners well these ones were rejects and so they might have had a a hole in them or they wound up getting sawed too thin or too thick or something like that. but they were rejects and it was a full pallet of them uh, four by four by four. And, and he said, these things, probably the driest thing that we have. And so I said, okay, let me have one of those pallets. And I, he loaded on the trailer. And I mean, it was, it was heavy. It was squatting that trailer. And I said, how much? And he says, 15 bucks. I was like, no problem. I gave, peeled out 15 bucks and gave it to him. I mean, you couldn't even you know, it was just a lot of wood there for 15 bucks. So we got it home and uh, I'm going to show you in a minute what the cross section of this retort looks like. But we have to load an inner barrel <clears throat> with wood and then you have to turn it upside down. You have the open end down and you don't want that wood to fall out. So uh, what we thought we'd do is, well, we'll just jam it in there real tight and then it won't fall out. But the pieces of wood were about like about four inches by most of them were about a quarter inch, you know, or less. And we had to cut them down so they'd be about 40 inches so they'd fit in the barrel. And then the pieces that we cut off, that became the kindling wood. And I'll show you where that goes when we open this baby up. Um, that's what I'm talking about, Vindicti. I'm talking about it being profitable to make. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, and I mentioned this last night. Um, the stuff that I see that is a hundred and the cheapest I found it was $149 a yard, a square yard, a cubic yard, right? And it comes in those great big totes. And you have to buy, I think, 10 of them. It comes out of Oregon. Uh, they are not making those in a gasifier like ours or a retort like ours. They aren't. I've seen these. These It's called a progressive unit. And I don't know all the ins and outs of how it works. But 
it comes down to they have a conveyor that can take a lot of heat and it's conveying these chips under flame the flame is blackening the chips and probably burning some of them and then it goes to the next station and they're extinguished and then it it's just a continuous thing so when they go into these pine forests and they have to cut cut and cut and cut and then they chip all that stuff then they're making biochar out of it um <clears throat> i you're gonna have to try that stuff somebody is it won't be me and see if it works as good as this stuff this is made with hardwood and it's made in a retail so it's it's far more labor intensive but if we look at under the microphone or the microscope you can even see it shiny that's because the porosity is so tight whereas if you use softwood the porosity of it is very loose right so the beauty of this is i don't know if uh, i explained this very good the other night yeah i did what we want to do is we want to make a habitat for our bacteria to propagate right and so the more cross-sectional area that you have the better and bacteria you could start with one bacteria and in 24 hours you could have six million they they propagate that quickly and more bacteria that you have the more protozoa you're going to have the more protozoa you have the protozoa are eating the back protozoa is like a shark the bacteria is like a feeder fish and then the protozoa is excreting manure that's your soil but they also release the energy from that bacteria and this usually happens right around the root area of of, uh, of plants so providing a good place for the bacteria to live makes a lot of sense that's why we want to use hard wood to do this so uh you might think and I ran this through my old computer uh, that, well, if these guys out of Oregon are selling this stuff at a dollar and 49 cents a pound, a dollar and four, uh, 149 bucks a yard, well, I can't compete that. By the time I make a cubic yard of, back, of uh, high quality hardwood biochar uh, in my retort, <clears throat> let's see. I would have burned it about five times and that's five days for 149 bucks no i wouldn't do that that's you're right it isn't profitable but hey can i have that block so i can show these guys what a block looks like you don't want to put that in that won't burn oh, okay all right thank you whoa that's a heavy one i'll show you in a minute uh but uh I, don't, I really don't care about that. Um, you will see we're going to start grinding biochar on a regular basis and put it in uh, bags and put a price on it and put the Baker's Green Acres logo on it and put it in our online store and it sells. It sells. And people can look at it and say, well, I can buy it much cheaper out of Oregon if I buy it by the cubic yard. Thing is, is who's, you know, who's going to buy a cubic yard? So we'll have to see, but I think you can, I think you can. What we started this off talking about was uh, uh, homestead. It makes a lot of sense to have multiple streams of income, like 10. And I went through the different streams that I have. Biochar is just one of them. Uh, if in the season we did really good with biochar and made several thousand dollars, hey, that's better than nothing, you know? Better than nothing. Uh, if I sold, you know, 50 pigs at 150 bucks a pig, hey, that's good too. Uh, if we sell 20 puppies at 500 bucks a puppy, hey, we're doing good. You know, we sell hamburger, we sell milk. You don't, you know, you really don't think about cow shares as profitable. Uh, but let's say you've got your cow share set at ten dollars, like we do. So every gallon of milk that leaves here is a $10 bill. And if it's set up properly, we have to milk every day. The milk goes in jugs. 
some of the milk goes in the cooler down by the shop where customers can access it. Some of it comes to the house. But there's just this steady stream of milk leaving here and ten dollar bills going in the uh the coffee can in there you know proverbial a lot of people just pay online and it might not seem like a lot but let's say that you knock back thirty dollars a day and it's just a chore that has to be done we need milk for the house we need butter for the house we need this that and the other thing um we take what we need and the rest of it gets sold and what doesn't get sold you know gets turned into cheese or or butter or you know cream whatever we the girls want to do with it but it all gets used you know my family has to be fed too so it might not seem like a lot but it it sure does accumulate i mean seven days at let's say you make forty dollars a day let's say you make fifty dollars a day that's not hard. Five gallons of milk. That's not hard. That's two cows. You know, when you get two really fresh cows, you're talking eight gallons of milk. And if you do this long enough, you will have a clientele coming to get your milk. I've got two new people coming on Saturday to get milk. And what happens is they're two separate families that are coming to, they come and they want to pet the cows and see the operation i take a half an hour and i show them around and then they're going to alternate picking up the milk because they live in the same neighborhood but then they're going to share it with their friends and their friends are going to come so it, we've been down this road before you wind up not having enough milk you have more people than you have milk and so if you want to milk you know you can milk five cows you know i mean you can you can knock down pretty good money milking cows. You really can. And uh, hey, I, I I for a long time thought, no, we want to do just one thing and do it really well. Just one thing. But as time has gone by, I'd have to go back to my wife and say, you know what? You were right. We do need to have multiple streams of income because they all kind of complement each other. All right, so people come in the yard to have their chickens processed. Like processing chickens is kind of a nasty job, and so people don't want to do it. Uh, we say, we'll do it for you. Uh, last year, we did them for $4 a bird, and we were doing 250 birds every Friday. And then sometimes we were working Monday and Friday, so two days. So do the math on that. You know, my kids work pretty cheap and me and Jill. And so it just makes things work. It's not like the be all and the end all, but it's coupled with other things that make it all kind of happen. So then you've got people coming in the yard, right? And they have to wait a minute. They're staring at a freezer that has a sign on it that says beef, pork, chicken they probably aren't going to buy chickens but they see it biochar milk you know baby pigs uh cow shares and so then hopefully they say hey i'd like to and if even if they don't you know when they go back out into the world and they're talking with somebody about something and oh you know who sells that these people up in Marion, they got a farm and you can go right on there and you can buy the, they even got a store you can go in and buy coffee mugs and all this stuff, which we, we don't have them in the store yet, but we have them in the online store. We don't have the good ones yet. We have the, we have the button ones, right? The, the good ones, my daughter-in-law Colleen's going to be putting up. So for, to, for a biochar side business, I think that's a good thing. But it's like any farm business. The first year you do it, you might not really have that much response. Not like you'd think. But then after a while, somebody uses biochar. You know where you can sell biochar to? Is the grow shops, the people that are growing dope. You know, the, the stores in town. Even the, the stores that 
uh, sell dope, the, dis the dispensaries, you go in there and sometimes they sell grow supplies. I have never been in one, honest. I've never been in one. I don't use it and I, I have no need to go in one. But you could, you could uh, make biochar, good high quality biochar, biochar, and you can sell it in three different forms that they would be interested in. You can sell raw biochar. That means it's, it is not inoculated. So it comes out like this and you can put it in, in bags just like this, you know, and weigh it out, sell it by the pound. You can put it in really big bags, really small bags. Uh, dope growers, they don't use a whole lot of soil. So maybe you could put it in smaller bags, maybe like a four bag or something like that, one gallon. Um, you can crush it up and you can put it in bags and you can sell ground biochar, biochar, uninoculated. Then you can grind it up and you can inoculate it, right? We talked about inoculation. You would make a, an, a compost tea and then spray that on the on the biochar that's inoculated you've inoculated with with biochar or with uh with bacterial soup fecal soup right um and your are not going to be different than anybody else's so you may make a, a a growing medium here that people say hey this stuff's the best there is and then get a really good uh logo on there you know then you can crush it up and you can do a 50 50 mix 50% biochar and 50% uh, compost. It looks really cool. And then you can put instructions on it. You can say, this can be cut, you know, with whatever you, whatever you think. I mean, you can kind of chart your own course here. Uh, it's not like the guy in the grow shop is going to say, well, I don't know, 50-50. <laughs> I don't know if that's a... It, you know, they don't really know, but then you put a, a decent price on it and you take it into a grow shop and you say, you interested in this? I make this, I make this at my house. Make sure you put a tie dye shirt on before you go in. Or, uh, if you are, now nah, I'll leave that alone. I'll leave that. Alone. <clears throat> <clears throat> but, um, and you might get a clientele going like that. Uh, and maybe the guy will say, well, I, I, I don't really want to have the product in the shop, but I can take your card and I can pass it out to, you know, our, the heads that come in, right? So that would be a, a strategy. And you never know. I mean, you might, this might progress into a, a really cool business for you. Uh, I did see... I was looking online and I saw somebody down in Muskegon that is selling biochar under a name. And when I read the, the website, they don't make it. They're buying it and they're repackaging it and they're selling it. So it could be, you know, that they're buying that cheap stuff out of Oregon, repackaging. No, I, I shouldn't probably say that because... I really don't. Maybe it's higher quality than ours, cheaper. I don't think so. All the books that we've read say uh, the denser the material that you use, like bone, the better product that you're going to get. Right? So, um, as a side business, uh, I think it's a good idea. And with that, I'm going to get my... Uh, my notepad going here. I am not going to be able to see. Okay, so let me see what you guys have written. When the notepad is up and I'm writing on it, I cannot see the chat. Okay, so let me just see what you guys have <coughs> have written here. Hey, the clerics with us, right on. You asked me to remind you. Okay, and there you go. I'm talking about that now. After hearing you talk about your scrounging success tonight, I'm probably wrong though. About what? I mentioned that my quick look at it, it didn't seem very profitable unless you had a large scale operation. 
Yeah, I'm not sure about that. We ha we have a small scale operation here, but people want to do business with us. There, there's really something to that. Um, I mean, I'm really not here to talk about business, but maybe I am. I'll talk about whatever you want to talk. But you know, when people come on the farm and you stop what you're doing and you talk with them and you just treat people nicely and the place feels safe, they want to have the place stay. They want it to still be around. So they'll do business with you, right? Um, you know, the chicken business is, here's an example. I'm not deep on anybody. That's not the point of this, but the chicken business, it's a crummy job. Somebody's got to do it, but there's money in it, right? So we do it, we grin and bear it, and we, and we make a little bit of money doing it. You know, it's like one of the streams of income on the fit on the farm. Actually, it's, it's not a single stream, uh, process it's a multiple stream process if you if you know how to engineer things it can be better than just that four dollars a bird which this year sports fans it is 475 a bird 475 a bird and my wife is really uh merciful when it comes to charging people money for anything she is to a fault and you know she's getting beat up every time <coughs> we have to pay for anything so we just have to make more money doing this than we have been um so uh it's a multiple stream deal actually because we get paid for doing the the birds for people uh, a lot of times the customers do not want any parts of the bird except the bird they want the feet they don't want the head That's none of that stuff so a lot of times we, I mean, most of the time we're taking all of that and it becomes a day's worth of protein to my entire herd of pigs, which my entire herd of pigs consists of three, eight, 11, 13. I have 13 pigs on my farm right now. Can you believe that? That's how crazy it's been. And I need some, if anybody's got some that they want to sell small ones. We pay a hundred bucks a piece for them, but I have the market and I flip them for 150. Yeah, that's the way it goes. Um, that's a, 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 a stream of income. So, uh, let's see, where was I? Okay. In order to do this, I'm going to have to, uh okay i wish i lived close by to get milk vindicti says been trying to find a supplier of raw milk around me with no luck we'll make it we'll make my own soon enough there you go if there's nobody around you and there's another one uh when you have people coming on the farm to get milk then you can sell them other stuff too uh, ghost is saying grow shops and weed outlets are a dime a dozen around here nowadays Almost as many dope shops as Tim Hortons, eh? You can tell when Canadians are talking to each other, they say, hey, that's how they know. I don't really notice, I don't really notice them, uh, but I don't look for them. Huh. Oh, Merrick's vaccine for baby chicks, okay. Oh, okay. Crystal says all TSC stores get that vaccine. Well, I you pay for that, you know, but I don't I don't get that vaccine. So I don't think they would be giving me that for free. Okay, Inga says Freedom Ranger Hatchery in Pennsylvania has non GMO broiler chicks. Crystal's just confirmed the above. Okay. Nance is with us. Oh, Coastal can't even get meat birds in Nova Scotia this year, all locked up for bird flu. Your government at work, they're going to get you one way or another. I'm telling you, you got to be able to work around them. All right. Vindicti says, Mark, I have a good name for your strain if you decide to expand 
into dope growing. Waken bakers. <laughs> uh, I got talked to about doing that and we were going to go that route. And uh, when I did, I wound up having people come to the farm that were dope growers. And I wound up hearing all the talk about it. And uh, I even went and visited a farm where they grow it. And I thought, you know, this is not really what I want to be doing. It's just not. So I changed my mind. Okay, Nancy's getting some eggs. Oh, you got your, uh, good. You got your uh, incubator going. We haven't got ours yet. We haven't gotten ours yet. We will. Whoa. Coastal saying, wow, the co-op chicks usually available here were all canceled. Wow. Hmm. That's terrible. Okay. Let's get on with this. Now, I'm, I'm not going to be able to see the chat. Let's see how this rolls. Jill said she got this figured out and we tried it and it seemed to work okay. And I can't even see myself on this. So I'll just have to do the best I can. So the first thing I want to do is uh, draw out a retort for you. And let's see. Okay, so this thing's kind of tricky. Okay. All right, here I am. Okay. Wow, this is not exactly like going to the whiteboard. All right, so here's the basic shape of the tank that we have right now. And it came that way. It's got a skirt on the bottom of it that gives it this. Wow, this is bad. It gives it this shape. Um, All right, uh, it's, let's see, uh, about six feet. You know, this is really strange because you don't look where you're writing. You look at the, um, you look at the screen. So it's a, it's going to take some getting used to. And this particular tank, we cut it off right here. We welded a wet, uh, hinge to it right there, and we installed a stack, a smoke stack right there. It's just a uh, an eight-inch piece of silo pipe, Oop. and it's welded on, right? So this cover here can open up, and now let's – I'm not going to open it up. I'm just going to draw a see-through. Okay, so on the inside, this it's a it's actually an oval tank, so it comes down like this. The squareness on the bottom is a skirt that's welded on to make it sit. It was a paint tank that was supposed to sit on a the deck of a of a truck, and uh, they bolted it down by this skirt here. Uh, on the inside, we're let's just do the X-ray vision thing. We're going to look through the inside and we're going to see a 50 gallon barrel. Whoa, that was weird. That we set in here like this. And this barrel is full of wood, full of wood blocks. Okay. Uh, you don't pack them in too tight. We found that out with the staves. We packed them in way too tight on the burn that we did yesterday, and it did not fully uh, um, cook off. All right. And then around this barrel, we have about six inches of space, and we're going to fill this with kindling wood. So just small pieces of wood uh, and blocks, too, because we got to get a good fire going. All right, then over here, well, let's say over here, 
we have a hole. And I'm going to just draw an arrow to the hole. Uh, but we have a hole there that is about, oh, three inches in di diameter. We have another one here. It's on the outside of the unit. Another one here and another one on the back side that you can't see. Then on the outside of this unit, right here, we have a wrap of what's called refractory. It's wool. It's a refractory wool. And to hold that on, we have roofing tin that goes all the way around it. I don't know how well this is turning up, you guys. Um, I'm probably going to have to get better at it. Okay, so to operate this, we light off this uh, this kindling wood, right? With the when this this cover is up, we light this kindling wood off. We let it get burning pretty good, and then we'll drop the cover, and then we'll have some good vent action going out the top. Um, you know what really would make sense here is if I took a picture of it and then I was just holding the picture up and I could point to it with my little pointer All right well anyway when this gets to burning okay where's my oh that's weird it just all went away on me Oh, wow. Okay, I got it back. Uh, when when this starts burning in here, uh, it'll catch on both sides, and the burn starts to work its way down. It burns from the top down, and as that happens, the ash and the embers fall to the bottom here, and they light it off on the bottom. And then these lightning holes that we see here uh, – provide a an air source for the combustion and you have a quite a bit of heat going on right here and this refractory wool that's wrapped around the whole unit will will direct the heat back into the inner tank and the inner tank is just all it is a 50 gallon drum with the end of it cut cut off and filled with wood and then we put a chunk of screen in there to hold it so when we turn it over and drop it down in here it won't uh, dump and what happens is the wood that's in here uh, has no exposure to flame so it doesn't burn it just roasts similar to taking a uh, let's say you took a dutch oven and you put wood in it and you put it in the campfire you know, the wood would just, it would just roast. It wouldn't, it wouldn't burn, right? You just get uh, nothing but, uh, but biochar out of it, nothing but charcoal, pure charcoal. So as this starts to roast, it, the wood that's in there will begin to gasify, right? It means the wood gets so hot that everything that's in it starts to just come out. And it gasses off is what they call it. And it's pretty noticeable when it gasses off because on this particular retort, there is a hole in the bottom here. And it was part of the original assembly. And when it starts to gas off, that gas comes underneath this skirt here. And then it seeps out around the, the base of the retort all the way around. So we filled it in with, we filled it in with dirt all the way around. And then the boys uh, put a, uh-oh, they put a pipe out here like this. And then the gas is coming out of there. It's this really uh, grayish um, yellow gas. And they light it, and it burns. It, it burns pretty nicely. Um, I would bet if we had it in a, a good, oh, uh, nozzle that would mix oxygen in effectively, I'd say you could get a pretty nice burn out of it. Um, and this is what they they actually use. Bring a frying pan down there and cook some eggs like as an experiment. But 
the other thing that happens is right around the base of the barrel on the inside, the gas seeps out and mixes with the kindling wood gas or the kindling wood fire. And then the heat, the temperature comes way up, way up quickly. And that gassing off uh, is quite quick at that point. All right. So I'm going to try erasing this. And I'm going to try and start over and make it a little bit neater so we can see it. I would think I could trace trace it on there. But obviously, I guess I can't. Okay. All right. Here's my hinge. Here's my stack. The stack is EI. Um, off the back of here, this cover is so heavy, we had to put a counterweight on here. So there's a tank that hangs on here. It's full of concrete blocks and rocks and stuff, just so we can actually open this cover. It's so heavy. And then when we look inside, we have the barrel. Whoa. I don't know what that is. The barrel that sits in here like that. Um, the inside view of this is sort of like this. So the barrel makes a pretty good seal on the bottom. Okay, that's... That's the one that we're running now. That's a generation five. The one that we had before that looked like this. We had a, I think it was a 600 gallon barrel or a 600 gallon tank, fuel tank. And I cut it and I made it shorter. So I cut out a section. There was a section about like this that I cut out and I still have it. But I didn't need it as big as it as it was. And then I found that a 300 gallon barrel or a 300 gallon fuel tank would fit in here about like that. And then we made the lightning holes around here like this. Uh, we had the refractory wrap on here like this. And then there was one stack didn't work so we had put on two stacks that didn't work we wound up with three stacks on there that's why it was called the triceratops and that one burned for a long time uh, the 300 gallon barrel that we would load up would make us about 250 pounds of biochar per burn and when this thing was burning out in our materials area it looked like some sort of spaceship because these lightning holes, as the uh, inner retort starts to release its gas, and that gas uh, it, it's deposited right in front of these holes, and you have this blast of, of air that's coming in, the combustion is really bright, like bright, bright, bright yellow. And so when you're burning the thing at night, it looks like a spaceship. And it, it actually roars when it's gassing off. This one does not. There's no noise at all. And the lightning holes are smaller. Joe made these ones. He made them square for some reason. But they're smaller. And... Uh, we kind of thought at first, well, uh, let's try it, but I don't think you have enough air holes. Uh, turns out that it burns very nicely. There's very little loss. Like on the Triceratops, uh, you know, you are putting a lot of wood in here, 300 gallons worth of wood. 
and you have to lift that in there with the loader. My loader wouldn't go high enough to get in there, so we would routinely have to make a kind of a trench for this thing to sit in and then uh, um, build blocks like this so the front tires of the loader would, would be up on there. So it'd be up high enough. So it was really treacherous getting that tank in there. And then getting it centered was hard. And then getting this top back on, this top right here, it was really heavy. And that could only go on with the loader. And if you had somebody helping you like a kid, I was always afraid that if it dropped, you know, it could really do some damage to somebody. But this, this Generation 5 here uh, is designed for usability you know the kids can actually do this if they want to i did it today it's a little bit it's a little bit of work but it's nothing like the old one the old one was a lot of work so that's that now let me show you over here i'm going to draw you a a 50 30 so you get a 50 gallon barrel like this and you have to get a 50 gallon barrel that has a a removable top on it you can find them and on that top you put a stack and you can do that with a piece of six inch black uh, stove pipe and then you have to find you a uh, a 30 gallon drum oops that's not so good right Okay, you got to find a 30 gallon drum that will fit in there. And 30 gallon drums, you can find them at places that do oil changes. Uh, Gear Lube comes in 30 gallon and uh, rear end. 98 gear oil, stuff like that. Maybe even some uh, different hydraulic fluids come in 30 gallons. So that will fit in there. And you merely take the top of this off. And you put your kindling wood around here. Uh, this barrel you put in there with the open side down. Um, it can be a little tricky to hold the wood in there while you while you do that, but it can be done. We uh, today on the generation five over here, what we did is we took a piece of um, hog panel and cut it so it would make a, a like a mesh that would fit over the wood and then i put a rod from one side to the other and another one crisscrossing that all in all right so all right so this is a this one here is a 50 30. so you're using a 50 gallon barrel and a 30 gallon and it's a good place to start but there again, you've got to have that refractory on there. I've heard people say that you don't, but I don't think that's true. I really think that you've got to have refractory um, in order to make the burn work well. And, and on this 5030, you have to have lightning holes on the bottom here as well. Right? They're not actually lightning holes. They're air holes. Lightning holes are something kind of different on airplanes. All right, I'm going to turn that off and see if there's any. Okay, I did it. Okay. All right. And you guys are talking about laying chickens over here, and we're talking about biochar. Let me see where I left off. Okay. We'll be getting chickens in a few weeks. Decided. Okay. Ordered Australopes. Yep. You know, um, with what's going on up there by them shutting down the hatcheries, I think I know what I'd be doing. Yes, I do. I think I'd be getting that. Uh, I think I'd be getting that incubator going, and I'd be pounding out some chicks.
Oh, Nancy says that she's seen $12 layers. Uh, a little high, but, you know, usually a ready to lay layer is usually like eight bucks, 10 bucks, you know, but 12, I could see it these days. And it's not that, you know, chickens are more expensive. It's just that money has less value. Twenty week old layers, yeah. Because they start laying, they say when they're sixteen weeks. I don't know about that. I've heard that all my my whole farming career, but it seems like they're a lot older than that when they start laying. Hey. Hey, yeah, coastal saying shortly after twenty weeks. Twenty bucks each at twenty weeks old. Wow. Now there's a farm, there's a stream of income. Wow, I would be I would be jumping on that. I mean, layers are so easy to raise. They are so easy to raise. Oh. Well, Dingus says thanks for drawing all that out. Okay, you got a biochar question. Okay, I'll give you a biochar question, Vintiki says. Ever make some from just a big pile of wood, no retort? Um, no, I haven't, uh, but I have seen. That was uh, starting up a biochar company. And what he did uh, was he had a. 275 gallon oil drum and he cut it off about two thirds the way up right there's a lot of uses for those 275 gallon oil drums you can scull pigs with it you can make barbecues out of them and you can make bottle char with them right and all right coastal saying that the electronic whiteboard works pretty good i i appreciate that i probably need a little bit more work on it it's a little squiggly you know it's not like regular writing you know just not but um i'll probably wind up going back to the to the you know just the, the one behind me i probably will i shouldn't say that jill got this for me so i better make a go of it um what was i saying oh yeah the guy cut that 275 gallon oil drum off about two thirds way up. Then he would get a fire going in it with fuel wood. They call it fuel wood, I guess. And then he would burn it until it, he felt as though it was all completely burned, but not consumed. So it, the charcoal was still there. And then he would extinguish it. And some of it, was going to be good quality biochar bio some of it was not uh it's going to be wet and some of it's not going to be biochar at all it's going to still have wood in it so that was how he was doing it and i don't know if he ever made it in that business i haven't seen him since that time it's he's kind of a friend of mine paul may is his name um i don't know if he's still doing it or not all right I saw someone burn a big pile of wood from top to bottom in a field and then put the fire out with water before the wood was burnt too much. Yeah, um, I've seen that too. Uh, when, let's see, the guy's name that came out here as the consultant to the guy that I was working for, I was the technical guy, I was the guy that could actually screw in a light bulb. Um, his name was Peter Hirsch. And he was from an outfit in New England called New England Biochar. And I still see their things occasionally. I don't know if they're still in business, but, you know, they made a go of the biochar business. And uh, he came out here as a consultant. He stayed two days. I got to know him pretty good. He's a nice guy. And uh, 
he did a demonstration for us where he took a bunch of kindling wood and stacked it up. So it was a pile maybe, oh, three feet high. And then he, so he stacked it up like, you know, you'd have one course going this way and one course going the other way, you know, all the way up three feet high. And then he lit it off from the top. Like when we light a fire, like a campfire, we usually light it from the bottom, right? Because we figure the flames are going to go up and catch the whole thing on fire. But he lit this from the top and it burnt down. And when it got to the bottom, all the fuel was gone. And so it basically went out. And you were left with just these, these sticks that were charred. And... He showed us a book that he showed us, and there's some whiskey manufacturer that makes a big deal out of charcoal filtered something or other. They, they filter their whiskey through charcoal, I guess. Um, and it had a picture of how they make their charcoal, and that's exactly how they do it. But they have great big piles, and they, you know burn it down like that i suppose that's okay it's definitely not an, an oxygen deprived um, uh, environment but maybe it is because if you start burning on the top and uh you have flames going up past the stuff that's already burned and it's just carbon maybe that is oxygen deprived right there and that is possibly why it doesn't burn off is because there is no oxygen for it to burn because the flames are coming up past it possibly possibly hmm. all right Nancy, I'm very glad I am ahead of all these things popping up where it's becoming more difficult to buy animals. Yeah. I tell you what, um, it is an, an obstacle course, and uh, I don't think we've seen the last of it, right? So uh, I would get real innovative if I were you. Right now is the time to be spending a lot of your your thought process of your sustenance. I think. I do believe. It. Okay, Jack's going to hit in the hay. Okay, Inga's question. What is the difference between charcoal and activated charcoal? Activated charcoal, what I have read on it, uh, is that they inoculate it with steam, all right? So they hit it with high pressure steam and it puffs it, it breaks it down. I'm not really sure why they would do that. I don't know what the gain, gain is on that because any of this biochar right here, we could crush this up and put it in capsules and we could eat it. You certainly could, and it's not a bad idea to do, all right? So that's what I know about activated charcoal, all right? So do I recommend uh, a side business with biochar? Absolutely. Uh, it's like having a side business raising chickens. If you don't sell them, then eat them, you know? And I, I'm not saying quit your day job and start making biochar, not in any way, but... If, you, if you're, and I'm, I'm never saying quit your day job and start a homestead. Keep your day job, build your homestead, and your off time would be watching TV. And then at some point, you're going to have more going on in the homestead than you know what to do with. And you're going to have to leave, leave the job and come home and homestead full time. You will have to. Uh, but that's after you've got it built up. Wow, lots of action going on. What's going on? Like, I'm getting all these notifications. Okay, X22 report, latest. Must be good. 
I'm just seeing if there's anything on here that I should comment on here. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, it's 918, uh, and there we go. Uh, I, I think I went through a more stuff on biochar, a little bit more. I am always open to talk about biochar. Biochar is one of the best advantages that you can have on the homestead. It really is. If you want to boost the fertility of everything on the homestead, that makes total sense to get into biochar. And then learn about inoculants, learn about soils, more and more about soils all the time. Um, if you can't make biochar, if you can't, if you're not able to, you can buy lump charcoal from the store. But you're going to run into sort of the same problem as you would if you did an open burn. You'll have some that's high quality, some that's really low quality, and some that isn't even burnt. Because they uh, lump charcoal, they're leaving some of the distillates in there, so you'll get that smell when you burn it. And, you know, I've read where those distillates... Uh, become food for the bacteria, some of them. I've read that. I don't know. All right, Keith's taken off. Some charcoals are cleaner than others. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend like any kind of briquette. Uh, man, maybe I shouldn't say that. I, I don't know uh, what they use as a medium to hold that charcoal together. I don't. So, but definitely I wouldn't use anything like a match light briquette. Don't make charcoal for biochar out of treated wood. Hmm. You don't think that that would be a distillate that would just leave? I mean, I, I, I never have done that, but sounds like Lone knows what he's talking there. I want to see your retort again. I would like to see that again. That was a pretty sophisticated looking unit. Um, oh, that was Lone Star that said that. You got the same basic uh, color as Inga. So I thought that was some charcoals are cleaner than others. Okay. I think that's a fair statement. All right. I'm going to wrap it up for tonight, unless you guys have any more questions about retorts. Now, remember, a retort, a charcoal retort is for making charcoal. If we wanted just a gasifier, that would mean that we're looking for gas as our wood gas as our final um, product. Um, when I built this, I wasn't really interested in that. I think I may. I think that would be a good good thing to to get into. Uh, Aaron Esch posted something on Facebook today about uh, the Keith gasifier. And it's a guy by the name, his last name is Keith. And he built a gasifier and he has it coupled up to a Chevrolet pickup truck. And the headache rack on the back of the the pickup is a, a cooling unit for the gas. And then evidently he has a has the ability to compress that right on board. And so he stores it. And if he's going to go someplace, he'll fire up the gasifier. So he's going down the road and it's there's a smokestack going. So it looks pretty cool, I guess. But that's it for tonight. Lots of new stuff, says uh, Coastal. Thanks. Thank you for coming. We have a, uh, a new video came out today, you guys, on the Anyone Can Farm experience, and it's a, it's a dandy. So if you want to see what the charcuterie class looked like that we did just here a couple weeks ago, go ahead and check that out. It's some of Joe's finest work. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I will talk to you tomorrow night. Open line Friday, and we can talk about anything that you want to talk about, so long as it's biochar. 
fantasía. 